Greetings, everyone. My name is Tom Shelton from Westminster Choir College in the United States, specifically New Jersey, if you are familiar with the states. I am thrilled to be at the Rovda International Choral Festival this year, and I'm presenting two sessions. This is the second called Working with a Male Changing Voice in the Choral Setting. So I'm, I'm going to start with my philosophical approach and I have a couple of quotes that I think kind of sum things up when you're working with um, middle school age boys and their voices are changing. If you can walk, you can dance. If you can talk, you can sing. I think this is very important because even the boys with changing voices and maybe they didn't sing during their voice change and then they signed up to be in your choir when they were in eighth grade and they haven't been singing and they have three pitches that are about around low G, an octave and a half below middle C, but they still have those three pitches. And the more they exercise their voice and use their voice, the bigger their range is going to become until they can finally um, be able to carry a bass or tenor part. So if they feel confident about what they're doing, they're gonna be very successful. There's a great man who makes every man feel small, but the real great man is the man who makes every man feel great. Um, you know, when your voice is changing, it's part of who you are. And so it can be devastating, particularly if, if you were always called out for being a good singer. And when you had an unchanged voice and all of a sudden you're dealing with all these new issues. So if we can make everybody feel really good about what they're doing, they're gonna be a lot more successful and they're gonna try harder to exercise their voice and stretch their range. Um, I want everyone to love music for life, not just the years they are in my choir. I think that um, this is really important. I want, I want all of my singers to know that when they're 90 years old, they can still sing in their community choir. And this is something that they can do to express themselves and to show passion and to love singing the rest of their life. Everyone doesn't need to be a, to major in music and, and shouldn't probably. However, everyone should be a music supporter and advocate. They should all want to sing as adults. And I, I put this up there because if we are turning people off to music in their middle school years, then we're doing a disservice to our profession because we need these people to love music, everybody. And so that even if they're not gonna be a, a, a choral director, they will still wanna sing in choirs and they will be a music supporter and an advocate for us. So information is power. With the changing voice, I'm gonna share um, some research and, and some uh, authorities who really uh, came up with the background and all the research information for the changing voice. So the first one is Duncan McKenzie and his voice was training the voice changing, uh, changing voice. Uh, uh, these were his thoughts, the progression of vocal change through what he calls the alto tenor. The concept suggests that a soprano one becomes a soprano two, then an alto, then an alto tenor, then a tenor. And the leading indicator of vocal change is a change in the speaking voice, definitely. Most educators would disagree with the upper pitches of the alto tenor or the tenor, and I'll show you what they mean. So you can see there's soprano one, there's soprano two, alto, alto tenor, um, tenor. This is kind of the McKinsey's uh, range chart. Now this looks beautiful, doesn't it? It's like you sing soprano, then you go to soprano two, then alto, then alto tenor, then tenor. Well, I, I will say, I taught middle school for 18 years and I, before I, I moved to the university and I love changing voice. I think that um, it's a puzzle and I think it's something interesting and every person is unique and different. Um, I, I will say I did experience this kind of gradual lowering of the voice with those children that were singing throughout their voice change. They had the least problems with their voice change. The problems, um, the, the most problematic singers were the ones that in eighth grade decided to sign up for chorus because their friends did and know and haven't been in choir for three years. So their voice changed. They haven't been using their voice and they're, they're the ones that are stuck with three pitches about an octave and a half below middle C. Um, the second set of ranges, McKenzie tries to classify bass voices according to grade. Boy, boys' voices do not mature at the same age, so we know that this whole grade classification um, doesn't really work. I think you can say, um, uh, I think that there are some characteristics of grade seven that you can say, or grade eight and nine, but they're gonna, they're gonna all change depending on the individuals that you have in front of you. Um, Irving Cooper, he had a book called Teaching Junior High Music. He was the first to coin the term cambiata, and it's a counterpoint term meaning changing note. 
Boy, and uh, these are some of his thoughts. Boys and girls with unchanged voices are quite identical in range. First change, second change, and then finally a fully changed bass voice. And um, his uh, perception that junior high singers should not sing in unison, which is, you know, to be honest, that's probably a good idea for the boys only because a lot of them don't have an octave range at this point. So finding a part that they can sing is more important than them being able to sing unison or a melody. And these were Cooper's ranges. So you see girls, boys unchanged, boys in the first change, boys in the second change, and then the fully voice changed. And then uh, he has the, uh, the tessituras for the soprano, the cambiata, and the baritone. Frederick Swanson uh, is another that wrote music teaching in the junior high and middle and middle school, the male singing voice ages eight to 18. These are his thoughts. Vocal, vocal change, sorry about that. Vocal change, there we go. Vocal change relates to puberty. I think we all knew that. Uh, great attention to register breaks and recognizes the importance of vocalizing downward. That is a definite that we still carry through with today. Recognize the continued use of falsetto, also very important. Um, voice classifications include no evidence of falsetto in, in, um, in their full range. Ranges seem to have very low upper limits. So let's look at that. So these are Frederick Swanson's um, ranges, so to speak. You have the boy alto, then you have the tenor, and then you have the bass. Uh, John Cooksey, who was the leading authority on the voice changing voice, he has eclectic contemporary theory of male adolescent voice change. Um, vocal classification to, le to new levels of sophistication, meaning that um, he had done a lot of research. And so he really propelled uh, our information on the voice changing voice greatly. Once the new voice appears, the high voice is ignored and all the charts from all of his studies show this. So Patrick Freer, um, using his research, has these things to say. The male voice change occurs in approximately five stages. All normally healthy boys pass through the five stages in a sequence that is 100% predictable, according to the research. The most reliable indicator of a stage of voice change is the total range of the singing voice, excluding the falsetto. Voice training cannot alter the stage of change because you can't change physiology, but voice training does assist boys in singing throughout the change process. And I would say that's probably one of the most important things. If you, it, it's like a muscle. If you exercise your muscle, then you're, it, then you're going to have more success. So those boys that are singing through their uh, voice change are gonna have less issues than those that do no singing. And these are um, the summary of stages of of the voice maturation in the adolescent male. So he has stage one, which is unchanged, stage, stage two, mid voice, stage three, mid voice two, stage four, mid voice 2A, stage five, new baritone, and stage six, developing baritone. Uh, okay, now we have Henry Leck, um, who was not new on the scene, but wrote about the changing voice in his book, Creating Artistry, which is a fantastic book if you have not read this. And he has a whole um, chapter on um, the boy's expanding voice, not changing, but expanding. So you'll see these are his range classification. He has a lower range of a bass voice, upper range of a bass bass voice, that means including a falsetto. And then the full range, he includes the falsetto in the full range. Then you see the same designations for the tenor voice. His whole approach is approaching the voice from the top down, bringing your head voice down. Actively work to maintain that upper singing range. Theories exclude the high voice and perpetuate the myth that once the voice changes, the high voice disappears. That means all the previous um, uh, uh, theories that we've talked about, they just kind of uh, didn't include the higher voice or the falsetto. So, uh, and that it just perpetuates the myth that that doesn't happen anymore. So we know that we are maintaining the whole voice with Henry Lex um, guidance. Experience has shown that boys who stop singing when their voices begin to change may actually lose the ability to manage their voice in later years, which I absolutely agree with. Rather than unwittingly pressuring boys to walk out, the ideal is to encourage them by having them sing whatever pitches they are able to sing. That's why it's really important that you know every voice so you know what their ranges are so that you can pick parts for them to sing that are appropriate. It's important that boys start at the top and carry that down through the break, making a nice transition. 
identifying changing voices. The way the voice changes is directly related to the speed and the manner in which the larynx is growing. It all relates to the change in length of the vocal folds called vo vocal mutation. Each boy will experience voice change in his own unique manner. The male voice is different for tenors than for basses. The voices of those who are becoming tenors tend to change with less interruption and less trauma. Usually the period of adjustment is much more severe and dramatic for a bass. For future basses, it can happen very quickly or it can take a long time. And it will take many variations and many adjustments before it actually settles in to a consistent range for either voice type. The high voice normally will not disappear once the voice changes. A boy's voice is beginning to change when some lower notes appear and he begins to experience some difficulty in the upper range. Um, Henry Lex says this about repertoire. It needs to be appealing. It needs to bring out the natural beauty of the voice, represent a variety of periods and styles, and provide viable options for all voice parts. A special challenge to find literature that will interest the whole choir and still include changing voices. Um, and then we're going to talk about SATB versus SAB. So if you have SATB, you're going to have specific ranges for the tenors and the basses. If you have SAB, you're going to have one range that combines the tenors and basses together, but that range is probably not going to fit everyone because it, it will probably go lower than some of the changing voices tenors tenors can go. Um, SAB versus three-part mixed. If you have three-part mixed, it usually means that the third part is between a G below middle C and a D right above middle C. So they have a range of like a sixth. Now, um, this is really great for some changing voices, but I will say if you're a changing voice bass, hanging out around middle C is not a good thing. So three-part mix doesn't really work for all groups. You have to be, I, I've used a lot of three-part mix music, but you have to be very careful about who's using it. Or, and, and you also have to be flexible with the parts they're singing. SAB just means that the bass part could be all over the place. Um, the bottom line is you have to know every boy's voice so that you can make the best choices in terms of repertoire, in terms of warm-ups, all of those things. So rehearsal atmosphere. Um, when I'm working with middle school, you have to set up an atmosphere where everybody respects each other. So you have behavior expectations. You have to be very cut and dry. This is what's expected. You have to um, give them an awareness of physiological vocal changes and the acceptance of that these issues are beyond their control. Um, you have to really set up a, uh, a feeling of respect in the room so that the the females will respect when the, the boys' voices crack. And I always say to the students that I have in front of me, everybody's voice is changing. But if you're a female, you're just lucky that you're not dropping an entire octave. Your voice is changing as well, um, but the boys are having to deal with a whole different octave and a whole um, uh, different type of change. Um, and the more that you can have single, single gender opportunities, meaning sectionals with just the boys, um, having high school boys come from the high school maybe to the middle school and to sing with them, to bring in, if you're a female teacher and you bring in one of the male uh, teachers at your school that can work with them, because the more opportunities they have to hear um, a changed voice and to have someone that can match their pitch, the better off they're going to be. So matching pitch. If your ship doesn't come in, swim out to it. And uh, you know, in middle school, you're doing a lot of swimming because there's gonna be a lot of people that have pitch issues. So you have to have a game plan of how you're gonna help them the best that you can. So uh, I will tell you, one of the best things that you can do is match it for matching pitch is sirens and slides. I'll start at the very bottom, I'll go, hey. Woo! So they're, they're experiencing all parts of their voice. And with all of the boys that are in front of me, I'll say, everybody do this with me. And I will start low. Hey, and I'll go all through my lower voice, flip it up into my falsetto and come back down. Are all of them going to be able to do that? No, but they'll be able to do some part of that. And they'll, they'll, they'll begin um, vocal exploration, so to speak, so that they can feel all parts of their voice. Um, it's difficult to fix pitch problems without working with individuals versus the group. So this is what I would do. When I was teaching middle school, I, I had all the, I was fortunate that I had all the boys in seventh grade and eighth grade in one, in one class together. So I would have them all come up around the piano. We would stand in a circle and I would have them sing, 
<clears throat> me so me and i would just go right around the circle and each person would sing the pitch and then if I, if someone didn't sing it correctly what i would do is i would stop and i would listen to them and i would say to the choir um i want you to give me a thumbs up if i am the same a thumbs down if I am different, because what I'm trying to do is get them to understand the listening component and if our voices are the same or different. However, let me make sure everybody understands, I am the one that's wrong. It's never the student that's wrong. So if they're giving me a thumbs down, it's for me. So what I'll do is I'll have the student saying, so if I sing, me, so me, and the student sings, me, so me, then what I'll do is I'll try to match the pitch. Uh, then I'll go, okay, try this one, me, so me. And then um, if they can sing it, then I'll then I'll try to move them up. So if they go me, so me, then I'll, I'll be like, great. Now, how about this one? So, do, so. And sometimes they can do it. And then do, me, do. So I just kind of drag them up the scale. Sometimes it's just a matter of meeting them where they are and helping them explore and move higher from that pitch. Um, if someone's off pitch, then what I'll say is sing any note. It doesn't matter what note it is. And they might go, mm -hmm. oh. And then what I'll try to do is go, ooh. Then I'll say to the whole group, um, am I right? If Is our sound the same or is it different? Give me a thumbs up if it's the same, thumbs down if it's different. Then I'll have I'll say, sing any other note. They may sing the same note again, but that's okay. So if they go, me, then I'll go, me. And they'll know that's wrong. So they'll all give me a thumbs down. And then I'll say, sing, sing that note again me and then i'll go me and then they'll give me a thumbs up so i'll say okay all we're doing is we're matching our sound waves we're making our sound waves exactly the same so you just have to listen and make your sound waves like the next person so then i'll say let me try a pitch you try it and what i'll do is i'll sing something very close to where they were so if they sing me i'll sing i'll sing this try this one no and see if they can match that pitch um then have him sing another pitch match that pitch again then, so if they don't match the pitch, then I would go back to where they were, me, and I'd go, no, and see if they could slide up to it. And that's all I would do. And I always try to make everything really positive. Even if they don't match the pitch at all, I, um, I make them feel really good about what they were able to put forth because the next, if they feel good about their experience, the next time I come back to them, they will try even harder and it's going to get better and better. The more that they try and the more effort they put forth, the better it's going to be. But this teaching them how to listen is really important and going around the circle and having each person sing is assessment for me. I'm collecting information. I'm finding out who matches pitch? I'm finding out who sings that octave lower. So if I sing me, so me, and they go me, so me, I'll know that they're matching pitch. They're just singing an octave lower because they're probably a bass. Or I might have someone sing, I might go um, me, so me, and somebody might sing it up the octave. And then I'll know that they're an unchanged voice. So all this information is giving, is, is assessment for me. Um, so if I go around, I always say to them, I, I never make it, I'm, I'm always about, life is about choices. You don't have to do this. If you um, want to pass, just pass. And then what I'll say is when I get to them, if they pass, I'll say, how about you pick a friend to sing with? And that way, um, that person can pick another person to sing with. Because even if two people are singing, I can tell exactly what's going on. Um, listening and knowing whether you are on pitch or not is half the battle. A lot of them just don't listen. They don't know how to listen. They haven't been taught to listen. Um, so that's really important, teaching them this skill to know when the sound waves are the same and when they're not is really important. You have two ears and one mouth. You need to listen twice as hard as you sing. I always say that to them, two ears, listen hard. Voice placement. Okay, so what I might do, let's say it's the beginning of the year and I need a really quick way to put them in sections. So what I would probably do is find a really, um, a song with a very limited range. Maybe the opening of Jingle Bells. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. That's a fifth, right? That's a, that's a pretty good range for figuring out where singers are. And then I would do it in three keys. I would do it in the typical change in voice key, which is F. I'll do it in B flat for those that are tenors or for those that are um, unchanged. And then I'll do it in D and that will either be for the basses or for the unchanged that would sing it up the octave. And I would just have them sing it in three keys. So here's the first one, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way and I have everybody sing it. And I'll say, okay, that's number one. Here's the second one. 
Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. That's number two. And then I'll say, which one felt better so far? Was it number one or number two? Then I'll, then I'll say, here's your third one. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. That's number three. Then I'll have them decide which one feels the best for them. One, two, or three. Then I'll put them in three groups. And then I'll listen to each group. And then, of course, I'll move them where they need to be if it's not if they're not in the right spot. But you'd be surprised how many people um, select the, the right group for them. Um, I encourage them all the time to sing. You know, I, I'm not talking about a solo, but I'm talking about a phrase, um, three pitches. I have them sing alone almost every time they come. Uh, and then it, it becomes a painless opportunity. It's, it's like, um, it's something that they're just so used to. It's no big deal. And that's going to help them grow and become more independent as singers as well. Self-esteem versus voice placement. Okay, in middle school, if I'm teaching and I have three-part mix, let's say, and I have an unchanged voice that should be singing soprano or maybe alto, um, but he is going to be devastated because all of his friends are singing part three. I would let him sing part three, um, only because part three is going to be G to D. He's not going to hurt hurt himself or his voice. I'll just make sure, I'll monitor him and make sure he sings very lightly. But if he's going to hate choir and um, want to drop chorus because he has to sing soprano or alto, then it's just, it's not worth it. It's, it's, um, it's counterproductive. So we want we, I want everyone to love the class and to love coming. And if that means he's going to sing part three, let him sing part three. Just monitor it so he's not singing too heavy. Vocal modeling. Okay, so um, I, I have a, I'm a bass, but I have a big voice. So I don't sing normally in my real voice. I try to sing in something I feel like they can echo. Like, me, so me, instead of me, so me. So I'm going to sing in a voice that I feel like they can model after. Um, I would say if you're a soprano or an alto and you're a teacher, a female teacher, um, singing in their octave is probably not the best because um, I think people hear timbre more than they actually hear. And I, they hear pitch, but I think they hear timbre. So I always say if it's higher in your voice, it's higher in my voice. If it's lower in your voice, it's lower in my voice. So um, it, it, it's kind of the opposite. When I work with children's choirs, I play games so they can hear. If it's higher in my voice, it's going to be up the octave for them. If it's if lower in my voice, it's going to be lower in their voice. Um, so I would do the same thing. I think if you sing in this range and you're a soprano and alto and you sing this, you know, three or four periods a day, you're going to wreck your voice. So I, I would never suggest doing anything that's not going to be healthy for you. And it's just a matter of them hearing the timbre and switching and adjusting. Warm-ups. Vocalises that descend and employ some movement with the body are more helpful. Those with a narrow tessitura of a fifth or a third are easier. Descending patterns are easier than ascending ones. No. So the, and you can even start above their break. No. So they sing through their break and then transition into their um, their lower voice. Um, vocalizers should be fun and employ movement to keep the voice relaxed and avoid strain in the mouth and neck. Vocalizers that employ a feeling of motion and a feeling of beat help to solidify musicianship. One of the best exercises, sigh coming from the top of your voice, lighten up and bring your head voice down as much as possible. Oh! I think the more vocal slides you can do, um, uh, because if you can slide around the pitch, you can sing the pitch. It's just a matter of figuring that out. Um, give validity to the process. Don't just go through the motions with your warm-ups. Use the warm-up time to review concepts and fix incorrect vowel sounds. And just remember, the right shape is usually the right sound when you're talking about um, beginning singers. Use passages from the music and problematic problematic text to create warm-ups. Find, uh, find a pitch everybody can sing and move exercises from that pitch. Um, Solfege is great for building tone, intervals, sight singing. Um, if you saw my other presentation, I introduced body solfege and then the curl and hand signs. And then visual recall, you sign the pattern and have them sing it in their head and then sing it out loud. So it might be, there's so, and they're gonna sing in their head, 
Samido, then have them sing it out loud. Most of the time, it's going to be correct. Um, remember your learning anchors, visual, oral, and kinesthetic. And then repertoire considerations. It's all about the range. We talked about SAB versus three-part mixed. The voice pivoting approach means that you might have three-part mixed music, but maybe the alto part or part two is the, the most comfortable range for your uh, change baritones. Then let them sing part two. Um, I think doing what is healthiest for your choir and for your singer is the most important thing. So knowing the individual voices, knowing which range is gonna fit which singer, and then putting them on that appropriate uh, part is going to probably be the healthiest thing for them. Um, do you have variety in your repertoire selections and the text? Is it appropriate for the age that you're working with? The art of decomposing. I throw this in there because I'm a composer and um, I write a lot for middle school and children's choirs. And if there were some parts that the boys could not sing in some of my music, as long as you have the part covered, and let's say that you have them jump up on another part, that's fine. Or you write in a note for them to sing. As long as you're not rewriting the song, but you're putting them in the chord, I think it's fine. We have to, we have to do certain things to help our singers as their voices are changing. And just uh, an ending, um, one of my mantras is be realistic, use common sense, be flexible and just go back to the basics. The right shape is the right sound. Be flexible in the, in the terms of you're not gonna get perfect singers in front of you. You're gonna get voices that are all over the place if you're working with voice changing voices. So you wanna be flexible, you wanna be really positive so that they have a good experience because they will really try hard. And if they try hard, they're gonna be able to um, grow their range and, and be able to sing a part and have a beautiful voice. These are some resources that I used. Uh, Teaching Music Through Performance in Middle School Choir is a great resource. Terry Barham has a couple of great books, The Boys Changing Voice, New Solutions for Today's Choral Teacher. Um, also, <clears throat> excuse me, Strategies for Teaching Junior High and Middle School Male Singers, Master Teacher Speak, great book. John Cooksey's book, you should definitely look into, Working with the Adolescent Voice. Lynn Gackle has one on changing female voice called Finding Ophelia's Voice, that's great. Henry Leck, I talked about, um, and Flossie Jordan. This is Creating Artistry Through Choral Excellence. Great book. Uh, Kenneth Phillips, Teaching Kids to Sing, another great book. And John Errington has one that's specifically for uh, church um, changing voices, middle school, youth choir. Building the youth choir, training and motivating teenage singers. Um, and then I would just remind you, expect the best from each singer at every rehearsal. If you expect it, then they will, then they will, they will rise to the occasion. And then I'm leaving you with my email. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, tshelton at writer.edu. I'm thrilled to be with you and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing you all sing. Thank you.